Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And a welcome, everyone, to the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. As we mentioned yesterday, Jim Garrity not here today. He's flying out to L.A. to be on Real Time with Bill Maher tonight. So uh, that should be a fun recap on Monday. In his place today is Eliana Johnson, also of National Review. Eliana, it's good to have you back. Thanks, Greg. Good to be with you. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for everyone as usual. Let's start with the good. All of them today dealing with the unfolding Bo Bergdahl exchange for five hardened uh, Taliban leaders uh, almost a week ago now. George Will on special report last night, Eliana, basically asked to respond to President Obama's comment that he's not surprised by controversies that are whipped up in Washington, meaning the controversy over people who are not happy with the exchange that was made over the fact that uh, Bergdahl may very well have been a deserter and, of course, that he didn't notify Congress. And so when it came to the president's commentary, George Will had this to say about people who disagree with the president. Well, when he says it's whipped up, he means it's synthetic. When he means it's synthetic, he means it's inauthentic, which means it's yet again a recurring theme in his presidency, which is that there's no such thing as honest disagreement with him. Now, clearly you can't exchange hostages and POWs and have all this without some kind of controversy. And if this is whipped up, the project of whipping it up is remarkably bipartisan. To take just two examples, both senators from West Virginia, Jay Rockefeller and Mr. Manchin, are clearly disturbed about this. Jay Rockefeller is no rookie. Manchin's in his first term. Uh, Jay Rockefeller is the fourth most senior Democrat in the Senate. So he makes two pretty good points here. I think most conservatives agree with Eliana. Number one, that this is bipartisan concern on a grand scale over what happened in this deal. And secondly, that for a president who constantly says, if you have better ideas, come talk to me about them, He's really not all interested in anybody disagreeing with him on any level. I think that's true. And I think you, what George Will said, that you, you really can't do something like this without having people disagree with you. Uh, on the one hand, um, people who have a visceral reaction to the fact that there were people who uh, who died trying to save somebody who uh, who, who walked off base and, and was captured, um, that there is a there are going to be people who who find that totally objectionable. And on the other hand, people who who say, as the president did, that we have, you know, an obligation to go in and save everybody. And and I think both views can be defended. But to say that, um, that, you know, there is only one point of view and any objection to it is whipped up is is absurd. Do you get the sense, Eliana and Jim and I were kind of talking about this yesterday, that Democrats are starting to grow weary of defending the president at this point? pace or is it simply that this particular story has so many troubling dimensions to it that they just can't defend him at the normal vociferous level that they become accustomed to? I think that Democrats aren't even inclined to defend him uh, here. I don't think you've seen too many of them go to bat because this story inherently evokes such strong feelings and I think you've seen Democrats voice them. On to the bad martini now and it's basically the latest details unfolding in this story. Fox News with an exclusive yesterday about the intelligence report done by a private contracting firm in the year or so after Bergdahl's capture in Afghanistan. At one point, he was actually held in a steel cage after he tried to escape. But at other points during his early confinement, he was in very good terms with his captors. He converted to Islam, seemed to be very chummy with them. They even let him walk around with weapons and take target practice with them. Uh, at another point yesterday, the Associated Press, citing unnamed sources, suggested that the reason that more people in Congress weren't notified was because that if any leak of this potential swap came out, the Taliban was threatening to kill Bergdahl, which seemed potentially plausible until reports came out that a year ago, the Taliban was floating this exact deal to the Associated Press. So what's the latest uh, fallout from this explanation from the administration? Right. I think the sourcing on all of this right now, I would say, seems very thin. The, both the sourcing of the Fox News report that says he converted to Islam um, is single sourced. And same with the Associated Press reports that the deal couldn't come to light and so on. And so I think it's really going to take time to sort out all the facts, which is something that um, the administration has said. And I do think that's true. I do think that we sort of need to wait and see over time what happened here. Well, certainly a lot of details to go. I think a lot of people 
rightly staying away from the debate over whether or not his health really was in danger, trying to diagnose that from a, a, exactly. 90, a 90-second video is a, a recipe for potential embarrassment. But on to the crazy martini now. And uh, Harry Reid was uh, speaking to reporters yesterday up on Capitol Hill. And he got a series of questions about uh, the Bergdahl situation, one of which, uh, in questioning from a reporter from Politico, was how is it that you seem to be the only one that we can find so far who is a member of Congress who actually knew about this ahead of time? Here's what Harry Reid said. I'm not sure I'm the only one. I mean, this made a big deal over nothing. The whole deal is, is it, is it, is it Friday or Saturday? What difference does it make? Uh, you know, we, what difference does it make? Well, first of all, that particular language in the wake of Hillary Clinton's Benghazi testimony is sending shivers down some spines. But, uh, Eliana, the, the suggestion that the controversy is over whether people were notified Friday or Saturday or when this deal was going to go down doesn't seem to be holding much water since most people were just completely in the dark, including the members uh, who lead the Intelligence Committee in the Senate. The difference it makes is that the president had a legal obligation to uh, notify uh, congressional leadership and he would have broken the law even if he had notified congressional leadership a day before he was supposed to noti- notify them 30 days before. Obviously, it would have been better if he had notified not only Senator Reid, but also uh, Senators McConnell and uh, the House leadership. And it's, it does seem as if Reid was the only one notified. And so, of course, it, it makes an enormous deal of difference. Um, and you've heard that from uh, Diane Feinstein and uh, the other members of the uh, intelligence committee. So it's just an absurd response. Eliana, this has clearly been the story of the week. We'll see how uh, it develops. It develops day by day. We'll see what happens over the weekend and into next week. Thanks so much, as always, for uh, being with us. We appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Eliana Johnson of National Review in for Jim Garrity today. We also want to note that today, of course, is 70 years since the Allied invasion of then-Nazi-occupied Normandy, France, June 6, 1944. Thanks to heroic sacrifice 70 years ago today, we were able to establish that critical foothold in Normandy. And then less than a year later, victory was won on the Western Front and throughout Europe in World War II. Today, we remember those who served, as well as those, of course, who lost their lives in that campaign seven decades ago in the cause of freedom. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Please join us Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.